Welcome to the ninth lecture of the course Reinforcement Learning at Paderborn University. My name is Oliver Walchert and today we are going to use the tools around function approximation, which have been introduced by my dear colleague Wilhelm Kirchgesner last week in a very general context of supervised learning in a reinforcement learning context, in particular on policy prediction. And therefore we will change with the base assumptions of this course where we assumed during the last couple of lectures that the state in action space or our problem space is of a discrete uh, form and also of a rather small form such that we can use tabular methods that this assumption doesn't hold anymore. So in particular we will assume that the space, state space is either consisting of at least one real continuous quantity, in this case we would have an infinite number of states we have to handle, or that maybe if the state space is still discrete that the number of states are such unfeasible large that we cannot really work anymore with tools based on uh, tabular methods and therefore we have to apply function approximation to cover the entire state space. And therefore, in contrast to the reinforcement learning lecture so far, we will assume that the state vector is really a vector and not a scalar anymore, and that state vector can then consist out of different discrete or continuous quantities. However, for this and also at least for the next two other lectures, we will assume that the state space remains discrete and feasible small, so in our or following the discussion we had introduced in the second lecture we can therefore interpret any action as still as a scalar and we don't have to use here an action vector so far. Moreover we will use function approximator tools which uh, are using differential functions j in this case and therefore we are assuming that independently of what particular function approximation tool we are using that that is differential and therefore that the gradient of j with respect to the parameter vector w which we are going to uh, optimize today which we are going to update in such a way that we can do a reinforcement learning prediction task with it in an optimal way is then the, the variable which will be used for the gradient calculation. Moreover, we will uh, focus uh, for this and especially also for the next lecture by transferring the reinforcement learning methods we have get to know already in discrete uh, fashion, especially value-based methods, and we'll try to transfer that to the continuous state space uh, problems, especially for the on-policy case. So today in the prediction um, lecture we will completely focus on the on-policy case and then next week when we will uh, continue in the control task scenarios and we will also focus more or less on on policy but also introduce a little bit of off policy methods. However, as I said, off policy um, reinforcement learning with function approximation will be uh, more or less a side topic. It's not uh, so easy to transfer it from the tabular case here to the strategies which will uh, use function approximation and therefore we will more or less skip that here in that lecture and we refer for example to the chapter 11 of uh, the reinforcement learning book of Sutton and Bato if you're interested in more details regarding off policy learning uh, today especially with a focus on reinforcement learning prediction tasks. Yeah, after that preface what will be the agenda of today's talk? First we will discuss let's say in a more general way what are the impacts of function approximation to the reinforcement learning task? Because this is really a paradigm shift from uh, coming from the tabular approach. And then we will get to know solution methods which are using the function approximator tools in order to do prediction. And we will use here gradient based solution methods. Then we will yeah, utilize this approach in so-called batch learning. So here the second point will be step-by-step -step learning and then as we already have discussed that in the lecture on learning and planning we can also use batch learning to speed up a little bit the learning curve. So we will have a view here in the third point for today and then in the last agenda point we will discuss possible extensions and modifications to 
the prediction uh, case with function approximation or in the general usage of function approximation in the context of reinforcement learning. But first, let's have a view on the general impact of function approximation to the reinforcement learning task. Now, coming from last week from using function approximators in the supervised learning context, there a very important key assumption was that the data which we are using to fit our uh, models is uh, coming from random processes which can be considered as static and also independent and identically distributed. However, now looking at our reinforcement learning framework, we can identify two very important uh, impacts which deviate from that key assumptions. So first, of course, the environment which we are interacting with could change over time during our learning process. For example, if we work with a technical system, there could be T and we are inside the technical system and the, let's say, dynamic behavior of that system is changing over time. Or if we are applying reinforcement learning, for example, in the context of advertisement optimization, of course, the user behavior uh, inside any, let's say, social network which uh, is flooded with uh, advertisements uh, is also changing over time. So um, here we can really say that the the process, the environment which we are working with is, is very often non-static. Moreover, of course, if we take into account the learning processes in terms of general policy iteration, which we can see here also again in the figure 9.1, is that, of course, that not only the environment can change, but of course also the policy can change when we do a policy improvement step. And in uh, this case, as we are going to evaluate the value, either the state or the action value of a given policy in combination with a given environment, if the policy is changing, of course the entire process where we get the data from is also changing. So in this case, we have two major impacts in the reinforcement learning framework which interfere with the classic assumptions of supervised machine learning and therefore uh, make the prediction task and also then the control task uh, harder compared to supervised learning. However, if we want to work with function approximation tools, of course we have to state the objective, we have to state the task, what we want to do, and of course starting with prediction today again, we want to formulate, we want to fit a parametrizable approximate function which we denote as v hat, which is trying to fit the true value function v pi from x and this uh, function is parametrizable by the parameter w uh, which is a parameter vector which we can change over time by learning. Moreover, for this today's lecture, we will denote as x tilde as a feature vector. So also, uh, Wilhelm talked a, a lot about feature engineering in the last uh, lecture, and you will also find in the lecture book of Bartol and Sutton an entire sub-chapter on feature engineering in a very general way. So we don't focus today on feature engineering as an, let's say, specific tool. However, we denote here by x tilde that our states might have been enhanced by feature engineering and therefore x tilde are the uh, feature vector is the feature vector information which is then used uh, as the input here for that uh, value function approximation. Moreover, of course, we are assuming that the amounts of parameter here denoted by xeta is much much smaller than the number of states uh, we are uh, facing because otherwise of course if that wouldn't be the case then uh, it wouldn't be make any sense to us to use function approximation so therefore we have a comparable small amount of parameters which are an important uh, set here of our function approximation value function uh, compared to the state space and based on this assumption we have an also interesting, let's say, consequence compared to the tabular reinforcement learning methods, which is generalization. So because in any step where I'm changing my parameter vector w, so any parameter part wi, for example, 
then it is very likely that this estimation function here we had is not only changed with respect to one specific state but inside the entire state space or at least at significant amounts, significant parts of the entire state space. And of course this is a completely different setting to the tabular case where when we applied a learning step either in control or prediction case then we know okay due to the discrete problem space and our tabular approach we are only changing the value estimate of one specific state or state action pair. Here with function approximation due to generalization that is not the case anymore it is very likely that we will change at least significant parts of the entire state space problem space with one parameter update. And because this is happening here we have to also make up our mind in order to rethink the prediction objective. So what do we really want to predict here in terms of the state value? Because in the tabular case we could use our a tabular based function estimation in order to estimate a specific value for each state. So the value function uh, was able to learn the exact true value per state. Uh, and also the estimates of course per state was completely decoupled from the other states. However, now as I just mentioned from the previous slide, due to generalization that is not possible anymore. We have the state space due to function approximation is now interconnected with each other and we cannot guarantee that our approximated state value function will be able to perfectly um, estimate the state value inside the entire problem space. So therefore we have to introduce a specific prediction objective for uh, our problem space here when using function approximation. And this prediction objective which we are going to try to minimize or optimize in a sense is the mean squared value error which we don't note here as a VE overline uh, which is again of course a function of the uh, parameter vector W and yeah mean squared value error so this part here is more or less I believe clear so what we do is we subtract the from the true value function which we are going to uh, estimate our uh, approximated uh, value function v hat we uh, take the square of that and integrate over the entire state space with a waiting mu and mu is a yeah, waiting function or a state distribution over the entire state space where when we integrate over the entire state space the weight is one so that's why we don't yeah let's say um yeah we have let's say a perfect weighting function here and we will discuss possible weightings on the next slide. However, um, basically what we have here is an weighted mean squared value error on a possible continuous state space. And therefore we take here the integral function and not the summation function because yeah, if we have a uh, continuous state as part of our state space denoted here in the bold X, then of course summation doesn't make any sense here and we have to use the integral over the state space. Also a practical note already here we will discuss that also in the subsequent uh, slides that of course that the true value function v pi is of course in most cases not exactly known. So this is not a supervised learning case where we already have the data on uh, v pi and we can use it in order then to fit a model on it. However we have to compute uh, v pi also as part of the prediction reinforcement learning prediction task for example by estimating um, based on Monte Carlo approaches or temporal difference learning. So um, this is also yeah, an important difference here to supervised learning that our um, estimation or that our yeah, function approximation target has to be learned uh, on the way and is not perfectly given from uh, a baseline data set. However, so we have this prediction objective which was formulated uh, on the previous slide in a very general way and as I said in the 
uh, beginning statement uh, on the uh, yeah, first or second slide, we will focus on on policy case. And in the on policy case, we can um, yeah state we can assume that this weighting mu uh, should be the on policy distribution following policy pi because this is exactly what will happening. We are not interested in the entire state space because yeah, the state space could be of course infinitely large or at least very very large if we have a quasi continuous state space. And of course we are not equally uh, interested into all the parts of the state space but only these parts of the state space which are really important to us. And important in this case of course are these states which are uh, visited using policy pi. So therefore in the on policy case we can interpret this weighting here as the on policy distribution. So that's why we can approximate our prediction objective VE overline by a simplified version, by a simplified cost function JW, which is basically then just the mean squared error of the oh, yeah, approximation error here between the true target and the approximated um, value function over the sampled steps k. So basically here the assumption is that our sample trajectory uh, xk is of course following the on policy distribution and because uh, this assumption is that we follow the on policy distribution then we don't need to weight it anymore so we can neglect that on policy distribution mu here and just sample uh, based on yeah, experience and then yeah, approximate ve by j. Of course, if we would um, like to, to use a prediction objective in off-policy um, cases, then of course we would have to transform again this mean, square, mean squared value error uh, from the behavior policy back to the target policy. And of course, as we, for example, have seen that in the um, tabular case when we used, for example, important sampling methods, we have seen that this transformation from the off policy uh, in the off policy case from the behavior to the target policy will add the prediction variance to the overall prediction uh, methodology and as we um we won't see it today because we we don't focus on off policy methods today however i just want to state here that the problem is when we would use off policy prediction then this combination of increased variance due to off policy uh, transformation between behavior and target policy plus uh, possible let's say learning problems numeric problems when we apply function approximation and therefore also facing that issue of generalization that then the overall risk of diverging during the learning such that we don't find a minimum of that cost function here but uh, to completely go nuts with our learning process regarding v hat is much increased compared to the on policy case as denoted here by equation 9.3 where we don't have to take into account uh, mu or any kind of uh, mapping between behavior and target policy so this just as a let's say side note why off policy prediction is a more let's say delicate um, objective here and um, we uh, yeah, just focusing here on the, let's say, nice case where we can approximate for on policy applications the prediction objective with that simplified cost function J. Yeah, so what are then the prediction challenges, even if we focus only on on policy prediction? Of course, what is the task in the prediction? We want to find a parameter vector W star which is minimizing that prediction objective cost function j and of course the first and very obvious challenge is that we need some kind of function approximator model so for example a linear estimator or some type of artificial neural network or any other type of differentiable function which is able to fit our true target v pi and of course this is a severe problem because if we are working with an unknown environment for the very first time we really don't know how let's say the inner dynamics of that environment are looking like and what 
functional approximator model is very likely to give us that perfect fit. And what is the consequence, of course? The consequence is that if we have used any type of model we had, which is not perfectly fitting v pi, then we will have, of course, an uh, bias estimation error. We will have a systematic error regarding that function approximator tool with respect here to the target because our model structure or model topology is not fitting our base target. And of course, also part of that is that the feature engineering, which is part of Xtilde here, of course, is also part of that entire uh, modeling process. So also the you know, feature engineering uh, pre-processing steps uh, have to be taken into account and both together the model topology in v hat plus the feature engineering in xtld has to fit v pi. Second ch challenge, even if I can assume that uh, v hat is nearly perfectly fitting v pi, then we have an optimization problem to solve here. And here we can very broadly on a general level distinguish two types of uh, approaches. The first approach would be we assume that our approximation model, which we can choose, this is our engineering um, engineering choice, uh, could be linear, so a linear estimator. Then, because our cost function is a quadratic cost function, we will get a quadratic or convex optimization problem. And this is what I'm calling the nice case because then we have a local optimum, which is also our global optimum in terms of W because we are searching for W. And by 100% certainty, we are able to uniquely discover that W star. However, of course, this requires linear feature dependence. So we have to ensure that our feature engineering, which we have um, done, which we have performed as a pre-processing set, is such good uh, that we uh, are able to use a linear function approximator for v hat in order to fit v pi. So this is of course a very uh, important requirement because otherwise we have this mismatch here again and we will have unsystematic modeling error. Then the ugly case or potentially ugly cases if we need to use a nonlinear function approximator such that um, most neural networks. And in this case, uh, we have a nonlinear optimization problem, which in most cases is also multidimensional because that parameter vector w normally has more than one by the multitude of elements. And in this case, of course, we will have the problem that depending on the specific function approximator we use and the um, also the initialization um, of W0 at the beginning of the learning process, that we have to distinguish between a multitude of local optima and the real uh, global uh, optimum which we are going to search for regarding W star. And of course, um, this is then yeah, critical because depending on, on where we start with our optimization, we may end up in a local optimum, which is uh, worse compared to the global one in terms of that uh, function, uh, objective function um, value here. Also, we will discuss that a little bit more uh, in detail also during the today's lecture, is that depending on the function approximator and our learning strategy, which we will discuss in the next section of today's lecture, that the overall algorithm in order to find W star could be completely diverging so that we don't find any optimum at all, but that the algorithm goes nuts and uh, we have to start all over again. So this is then, yeah, let's say really a, a serious issue here, then if we have to apply nonlinear function approximation, that there are two very, let's say, big challenges. The first one is that we will only find the global optimum and not a uh, local optimum, which is uh, maybe much worse compared to the global one and of course the general risk of diverging with our algorithm. So after we have discussed the problems and the challenges of reinforcement learning using, using function approximation with a special view uh, today on prediction, 
next lecture we will also have a look on the control task we are using gradient based solution methods in order to find that uh, parameterizable function um, we had in order to solve the LL prediction task basically what we do here with the gradient based updates is we transfer the idea of incremental learning which is stated here in equation 9.5 from the tabular case and we will just adapt that idea so that's why also here x is again uh, a non-bold uh, symbol because this is like the let's say just recap from the tabular case we will uh, use that idea and throw it into gradient descent update so what we do is we take our old parameter um, vector w and we alter it based on some step into the gradient direction of our cost function j so what we do is we will find the gradient of j with respect to the parameter vector w so this is then our search direction of the gradient descent update and we scale that search direction by our learning rate alpha which we can consider the step size of the gradient descent update so the question arises: okay if we need the gradient of our cost function j how can we retrieve it and basically we have two options the first option is a full calculus of j so or the gradient of j so batch um, gradient we will discuss a little bit the batch gradient calculus also later in the next section however one uh, problem of course would be that uh, we really have to evaluate on a full sample sequence regarding uh, the states and of course that might be computational uh, costly and also we would have to wait until that entire state sequence for example in an episodic task um, has been obtained and this is of course also accounting or this is then contributing for learning delays and also if you maybe think uh, one step further if we want to apply prediction as part of the control task in the GPI context then of course uh, our policy pi is changing over time when we perform a policy improvement step and therefore the um, I've called it this full calculus of the gradient of J and that uh, batch sense um, that let's say that batch might be then not fully re representative anymore of uh, the policy pi because we have changed policy pi over time and therefore we have some strong arguments not to use that full batch evaluation of the gradient of j but to use again stochastic gradient descent as also william introduced it last week for the supervised uh, learning here again in the context of reinforcement learning in the prediction case and therefore we are not taking the let's say full state sequence to calculate uh, j but we just sample uh, one state so at one sampling step k and update the parameter vector w at that specific uh, time step k so basically what's happening then we approximate the gradient again just by uh, the chain rule and the idea is then as depicted here or yeah illustrated uh, in figure 9.2 that the uh, stochastic gradient descent using a multitude of samples so over a multitude of time steps k one two three and so on uh, will then lead in expectation to the same let's say parameter vector w uh, as if we would use regular gradient descent by just averaging the samples over a multitude of sampling steps and of course another thing is that we get an update of our uh, parameter vector in every time step and therefore learning can be um, accelerated or can be at least synchronized also with the control steps where we may want to change our policy in every time step as well however what we're doing here so we have a um, optimization task which could be possible non-linear so the optimization task 9.4 is to optimize for w uh, with respect to the cost function j and as we have discussed it could be nonlinear if we are using a nonlinear function approximator that could be very likely multi-dimensional if we have more than one element in our parameter vector w and it is also very likely non-stationary 
uh, especially if the policy or the environment are changing over time. And we apply gradient descent to that. And basically, if you already have heard one or two lectures on optimization, this is really one of the worst things what you could do to such kind of optimization problem. Because basically you have been very lucky or you have to be very lucky to find W0, so our initiali initialization of the parameter vector, which has to be very close to the global optimum. Otherwise you will just, because we're using gradient descent, you will just travel to the next, let's say local optimum, depending on W0. And that could be, as already discussed, much worse compared to the global one. Also, if we're really uh, operating a nonlinear, multidimensional, non stationary problem, the tuning of alpha of our step size is also a very uh, delicate option because we could, uh, for example, ju jump out of cost values, value, uh, valleys, and uh, potentially diverge or lead to any chattering uh, regarding WK. So in this case, we uh, have the problem that also on a numerical basis, we may be not able to find a local optimum even with respect to W. And therefore, using stochastic gradient descent or any gradient descent methods for such type of optimization problem is normally something which we really don't want to do. However, we do it. Why we do it? So basically because it's striking simple and it's done in all lecture books and therefore also we're doing it here today. However, we will also discuss in the last section of today that there might be alternatives compared to stochastic gradient descent or any type of gradient descent updates in the context of such optimization problems uh, in the reinforcement learning regime. So basically, what is the gradient descent parameter update then? It is uh, just plugging in the uh, previous um, idea of the stochastic gradient descent update is, is that our new parameter vector w at the time step k plus 1 is the old one plus learning step rate um, times the deriver uh, times the difference between our target which we will uh, estimate or also based on, on data we will discuss it later minus our estimated function approximator times the a gradient of that function approximator with respect to w. And this will be the next. Uh, the question is where comes that true target from? And that target of course is normally not known. Uh, for example due to noise there might be some measurement noise here on x and of course as we will discuss that yeah, not on the next slide but I believe on the over next or maybe in three slides the learning process itself, especially if we're using bootstrapping estimates. However, we will discuss that very soon. But before that, I want to give you a very short example of that generalization uh, problem, which we have discussed at the beginning of today's lectures, because now if, as we have introduced the parameter update rule, we can give you, let's say, some intuition how the generalization uh, impacts the entire state value estimation in the state space. And therefore we have prepared a very simple parameter update example where we wanted to do function approximation in the linear fashion. So we have a linear combination of three parameter elements, w1, 2, 3. And our feature engineering here is very simple. We assume we have two true states, x1, x2. And the feature engineering in terms of that linear function approximation here is just to add that one, which will be multiplied with w3 in order to make a bias correction of the estimate. We further assume that we have an initial parameter a vector w0 of 1, 1, 1. And when we uh, operate in the yeah, first step or the step, where we apply our state x0 as 1, 1, that the true target v pi would be 1 and our learning value, learning rate is 0.1. So with that information we can then perform the parameter update for uh, w at time step k equals 1. And this is just plug and play with our previous formula. So w1 will be w0 plus the learning rate times the difference of the true target 
uh, minus the estimated target. So learning rate alpha is here. This is alpha. Then the true target we said, okay, this is one given. In this case, simplified assumed, we will discuss that, how realistic that is to, to get that also later. So this is one. And then the estimate, okay, uh, at the zeroes, zeroes, um time step, k equals zero. Uh, we have plugged in one one, so with the feature engineering that would be one 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 times the zeroist um, parameter vector, also one one one. So basically, what we get here is three. So this is then this one, and then the derivative, so the gradient of v hat with respect to w. So this is basically then the uh, feature engineering. Uh, vector which is left here and as we have discussed this is one 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 so we can plug that in here and if we then calculate this okay here we get minus two times point one and then times that uh, feature vector here we get minus point two for every of the parameter uh, elements and basically our new parameter uh, value is then here point eight for all elements and if we illustrate that in the state space basically what we get is a plane in the three-dimensional uh, space of x1 x2 and the approximated state value here on the left hand side we would have uh, k equals zero for the uh, yeah initial parameter case where we see that plane here and then after the parameter update we can see on the right hand side so here for k equals uh, one that although we have only discussed or took into account one specific state uh, state one one so something which would be like around roughly here that we have also changed the estimates of all other states because that plane as you can see here has changed in its overall orientation into the three-dimensional space so this is an important let's say observation that due to function approximation when applying only uh, even only one specific state space update that the entire state space or that might be the entire state space is altered in terms of the function approximation v hat. And after this very abstracted parameter update example, the question is now how can we implement the uh, gradient based parameter update idea into the reinforcement learning algorithms, which we already know from the tabular case, and now transfer them to the case of function approximator usage and here we will start with the Monte Carlo prediction uh, case which is yeah the most simplest one straightforward so basically what we do is we uh, are transferring the idea of Monte Carlo of full episodic sweeps and the target which we are using for our uh, parameter update here vpi is yeah, approximated by that full episodic return g based on one yeah sweep through the episode and basically the uh, code implementation of the every wizard gradient uh, monte carlo method is shown here so we have to give some inputs of course a policy pi which has to be evaluated because we're doing here prediction a feature representation including uh, the yeah feature engineering here denoted by a function of f and differentiable function we had which could be any type as i said differential function it could be a linear estimator as from the previous slide some uh, decision tree or also artificial neural network or whatever you like which is uh, feasible of working with the gradient based parameter update step and for that update step of course we also have to yeah, give a step size alpha and uh, we have of course to initialize the value function weights w uh, normally arbitrarily or maybe also based on some uh, expert knowledge if applicable and then we sweep through different episodes as we have known that from the tabular case for monte carlo as well so we generate sequences of uh, state action and rewards following that policy pi which is evaluated for that sequence we 
uh, calculate then the every return visit. I don't give that uh, yeah specific formula here again. I believe it's straightforward and can be just uh, yeah recalled from the uh, table or case as well. And then uh, for every time step, when we have the every visit return available in the Monte Carlo sense, we can just perform that parameter uh, update as denoted in the previous and also in the uh, second last slide. So we just update with here our target G, which is not now the true state value target, but an estimate based on the sampled return series. So this is really straightforward. We can just plug and play it as we have done it in the tabular case. However, as, uh, as yeah, illustrated in the previous slide, uh, that uh, the learning here is a little bit different due to the generalization issue. However, this was, let's say in the Monte Carlo case, the simplest one because the target G, so our uh, sampled return from an episodic task, can be known or can be sampled very easily and is completely independent from the parameter vector. However, if we are using bootstrapping, as we uh, have introduced with temporal difference learning, which can be then also applied to non-episodic tasks, which is a very important feature of the temporal difference approaches, is that in the case uh, of bootstrapping that uh, our estimate of the true target v pi gets also dependent on the estimate v pi uh, v hat. So this is then um, also yeah critical, or is something we have to take into account. Moreover, of course, if the v hat is not perfectly fitting v pi, we have discussed that uh, already. That this is a potential challenge of yeah using function approximation in the reinforcement learning context. Then this estimate of our true target, which is not available as a IAD static data stream to us as in the supervised learning, but we have to estimate the targets by ourselves in the reinforcement learning context. Then this estimate by v at also get a biased, which will really inflict with our overall prediction quality. So if we are yeah, illustrating that as an example, for example here in TD0, so in TD0 um, our estimate of the true target v pi is of course, as we have learned, is the uh, sampled return plus the bootstrapped state value of the successor state x prime, uh, eventually discounted. With that, um, we could uh, calculate the cost function j of the prediction objective in the on policy case. So basically, here we introduce our uh, target of the estimation by the bootstrapped estimate at time step k and put in the successor state xk plus 1. And now, of course, if we want to use a gradient descent approach and we are going to calculate the gradient of that bootstrapped prediction objective j here with respect to omega, we have to take into account that the uh, by the chain rule that the gradient here of the uh, outer part of the chain rule is not only applying to a v hat at the time step k, but of course also to due to the bootstrapped estimate to the bootstrapping idea to v hat at the time step xk plus 1. And therefore, the a gradient calculation in that TD0 case gets a little bit more complicated. And, and of course, also from a numerical sense, we have to evaluate v hat uh, at least a couple of times. Uh, so here in terms of the absolute values, two times and two more times in terms of the gradient of that function. And the idea of the so-called semi-gradient methods which I, I would say in terms of, of gradient descent based updates in the, in the world of reinforcement learning are the default case are neglecting this first part here. So it is neglected the bootstrapped impact with respect of the gradient. So in a plain sentence, semi gradient methods neglect the gradient component of the bootstrapped target estimate. So again, this one here would be not existing. 
What is the motivation behind that? Of course, the idea is again to speed up the calculation of the gradient such that we don't have to evaluate the gradient two times but only one time and therefore that the overall uh, inference of the gradient of J is, is quicker and we hope more or less that the uh, simplification error is small. So basically that's the idea which could be especially of course true if we have in this counting uh, which is uh, not close to one but um, significantly smaller than one because of uh, of course then this first part here would be reduced in its impact. So if we apply then the gradient uh, TD0 basically our gradient from the previous slide is simplified in terms of that gradient um, part here with respect to V hat where we only take into account the gradient of v hat at time step k and not uh, also at time step k plus 1 including the discounting. So this is then here the gradient or semi gradient of j with respect to the td0 update. And if we apply that in an algorithmic implementation uh, we get again a very let's say yeah compact the implementation pseudocode uh, where we again have to put in the policy pi which has to be evaluated a feature representation we get a differential function of course and what is very important uh, which is now different compared to the yeah, simple Monte Carlo case that when we um, apply the terminal state or feature in that case so when an episode is terminated, then our estimate state value has to be zero. So this is an important requirement in terms of that combination of feature engineering and the topology of our state value approximation. That if in any case we are terminating the episode, that has to uh, give an output of the state value of zero because otherwise, of course, we would make an systematic error here because this target here so this was again here the estimate of the target of the state value prediction uh, has to be zero in terms of the bootstrap estimate when the episode is terminating right so if we are terminating this one gets zero and we only uh, estimating on the sample return for that terminal step so this is an important uh, requirement which was not um, required for Monte Carlo control because there we uh, yeah, sampled the full episodic returns and here due, due to bootstrapping we have to take that into account. Yeah, step size alpha, it's clear. We have to initialize weights, also very clear. And then for a couple of episodes, in every episode we initialize x0, uh, potentially randomly or with some yeah, exploring starts maneuvers. And then we apply an action based on that policy. We observe the state transition and reward feedback and then just apply the uh, parameter update rule with the gradient based here on, or not gradient, semi-gradient based on equation 9.9 .9, which is basically shown here in that, um, that line here. And of course we exit that loop if we observe that xk plus 1 is terminal and go to the next episode. So basically a very compact representation of TD0 and of course we can also use a bootstrapping idea in an n step fashion as we have introduced that in the tabular case as well. The only thing which is, is changing really uh, compared um, to the semi gradient TD0 is here that our target of course gets the n stepped bootstrap target of the true uh, state value and um, more or less the algorithm of the n step semi gradient TD is pretty much just a straightforward combination of what you already know from the tabular case plus that uh, yeah, updating of the parameter vector in terms of semi gradient approaches. So basically, most of that code here should be already familiar uh, for you from the tabular case, and the only, yeah, let's say, alteration to that is that we estimate now the targets uh, here by in bootstrap estimates and that we change the parameters which of course didn't have been um, 
required for the tabular case because we didn't have any parameters in terms of a function approximator. However, very straightforward, therefore I don't go here into details. Um, maybe have a look uh, in your own pace. So basically everything which you already know from nstep.td plus semi-gradient based updates in terms of that a function approximator parameter vector w. Yeah, so with that, we already fully discussed gradient-based prediction, either with full gradients or stochastic gradients, especially uh, in terms of uh, Monte Carlo or semi-gradient-based for temporal difference learning. And now we want to extend this yeah, tools by batch learning. And we have discussed that the incremental learning already uh, in the tabular case is not very data efficient. During one uh, learning step, we just um, update our state value uh, approximation state value estimation in an incremental fashion and therefore we are not utilizing the given information the given data to the maximum possible extent and of course this is also the same in the uh, usage of function approximation and SKD where we just uh, take a little small step into one learning direction and we don't use the available uh, data, the data available feedback uh, from the environment to maximum extent. And the idea here, again, as we also discussed that in the tabular case, is to apply batch learning. So we assume that we have a fixed and consistent data set D, which is uh, consisting, of course, of states and the uh, targets, so the state value targets, uh, or at least, of course, if we don't have the true targets, then in uh, estimate of the true target in the Monte Carlo or temporal difference sense and we want to use that batch of data in order to uh, find W star so the parameter vector which gives us the best possible prediction performance. Important here of course in a reinforcement learning sense is that the data set has to be consistent so it has to be uh, fitting to one specific policy pi, right? So if we change policy pi uh, somewhere in the middle, then the data set, of course, is not consistent because we would intermix uh, data uh, from two different policies and then using batch learning over two different policies would, of course, lead again to a systematic prediction error. So this is therefore a very important requirement that D has to be consistent with respect to one policy pi. However, if we have that data set available with that requirement as mentioned, then we have basically two options uh, for batch learning. The first one is to apply experience replay, which you also already know in the tabular case from uh, planning and learning in the Dyna framework. Um, and the second one is a, let's say, special case. Uh, if our function approximator we had is a linear function approximator, then we can apply closed form least square solutions. However, we will first have a very short view on experience replay and then to the special case of least squares solution. So yeah, experience replay, something which is really straightforward. So we assume that we have this consistent data set D, which is available with uh, targets uh, from the state value or estimates of the state value by uh, Monte Carlo or TD and uh, of course the states uh, themselves. And then what we basically do is we just repeatingly sample uniformly a batch out of that uh, entire data set with up to B um, state value pairs uh, and we call that a mini batch. And for that mini batch we can apply uh, for Monte Carlo, the yeah, classical gradient, uh, stochastic gradient descent update, or for TD, the semi-gradient uh, based update in a batch sense. So therefore, we calculate that um, yeah change in terms of the parameter vector W not uh, once, but more or less as an average over B samples from that mini batch. And so basically, yeah, same formula as before. However, we're just evaluating it up to B times and therefore trying to get a best, better estimate of the gradient direction compared to the vanilla implementation of stochastic gradient descent where we really just take one um, sample 
but here we take up to B samples and therefore we are trying to find a good optimum uh, compared from the full uh, gradient based calculations where we have to take into account let's say the uh, in entire data set uh, and also of course we want to because this this would be very computational um, demanding of course and of course we also want to get a best, better estimate of the gradient compared to the classical stochastic gradient since where we only take one sample into account and therefore this mini batch learning of SKD is something in between these two uh, extreme uh, ways of calculating the gradient. The idea of uh, air experience replay of course is universally applicable uh, only v hat has to be any differential function which was of course al also our initial statement that v hat has to be a differentiable function and we can uh, apply experience replay in the presented fashion here. The yeah, normal tuning requirements regarding alpha of course apply so we should take care of probably tuning alpha over the number of sampling steps in order to prevent um, diverging of the entire uh, prediction task and also trying to find the yeah, steady state solution by taking alpha for example to small values after a couple of uh, updates and uh, yeah if, uh, as I mentioned that the true target of course has to be approximated either by MC or TD targets. So with that approach we can go forward in the batch learning sense and apply it with any kind of function approximator we have introduced. Then a special case is uh, the least squares approach for reinforcement learning prediction where uh, two things have to be uh, assumed. First as I said the function approximator has to be a linear estimator and the data set D uh, again has to be a fixed representative data set following the on policy distribution. So if that is here again mixed out of different policies then um, of course we get a biased and um, yeah, screwed uh, estimate of the date value. However if that applies both then we can find a closed uh, form solution to our quadratic cost function. So this was the um, cost function j and uh, we can find that the uh, problem which we are then facing is a quadratic cost function uh, which is basically an ordinary least squares problem or also linear regression problem which can be solved in a closed form way. And on this combination or the combination especially of ordinary least squares and td0 in order to get the uh, estimates of the targets is also called LSTD which we will focus on through the next three or four slides. However the same methodology can be also applied to n-step learning or Monte Carlo however we don't uh, focus on that here and we will only show the details on LSTD so if you are interested in the same methodology for n-step learning or Monte Carlo learning then yeah, just derive the equations by your own it's uh, just straightforward. So basically what we will do is we will just rewrite our cost function here again, cost function j, by introducing a linear function approximator in the td0 case. So td0 means we are approximating the, the true target v pi by the sampled reward plus the discounted future state value in state xk plus 1. And this estimate here as we said has to be a linear estimator so basically what we get here is a linear combination of the feature vector times a parameter vector w and we are going to insert that estimate of the true target in our cost function at this position and if we rearrange it um, in the accredited cost function we will find that basically our estimation objective or prediction objective is now um, to more or less predict our reward at time step k plus one. So this is our um, target, our dependent variable in the least squares sense and our regressor, uh, our regressor is the uh, feature vector at time step k transposed minus the discounted feature vector transposed at the next time step k plus one times our yeah, unknown, uh, our parameter vector w, which we are going to try to find. So with that LSTD, 
basically our yeah, idea of estimating the state values of course is still applicable however in technical terms we are now using the feature vectors and our parameter vector in a linear fashion to make a prediction make an estimate on the uh, reward series on the reward feedback from the environment so summarize that so we have a credited cost function with respect to the state vectors as or feature vectors as uh, regressors and our dependent variable here our target becomes the reward feedback and as this is the section on batch learning we can sample up to b um yeah target vectors and uh, regressor vectors from our data set and can rearrange a target vector y uh, which is then here the uh, one to be uh, rewards we have sampled and our regressor matrix on the least square sense would be then vectors out of this um, difference here of the feature discounted future feature vector and the actual feature vector in an yeah transposed way and we can just write them here um, underneath each other such that we get an uh, yeah, regressor matrix in the usual way of ordinary least squares and as you know from yeah, Wilhelm's last lecture on supervised learning if we have a linear regression task we can give directly the closed form solution by uh, this formula 9.12 so basically we have that regressor matrix transposed times the regressor matrix that inverse times the regressor matrix transposed times our target vector y and with that equation we then directly get w star in a closed form solution and we don't have to apply any incremental learning steps which is of course a very nice um, feature here a very nice characteristic of lstd that we get w star right away in a closed form solution in the literature you will also find that w star is also of the td fixed point because that would be also um, w star would be then also the parameter vector which we would apply if we um, uh, if we apply the incremental learning updates in the semi gradient based fashion uh, for an infinite number of times and then um, tuning alpha probably we would get w star the state value prediction with that linear estimator of course is then also straightforward we just need the feature vector transposed times that found optimal parameter vector w star and we get directly our uh, state value estimate for the respective part of the state space however of course there are also a possible drawback um, as we are doing prediction here we don't have it in our own hands um, how the policy pi is giving us feedbacks from the environment so the um, regressor matrix xi here might be uh, highly linear correlated so the different rows of xi might be highly linear correlated depending on pi so pi could be anything we just could stay like in the same spot of the state space all over again and if we sample um, the same spot of the state space all over again in that um, regressor matrix here we would just have uh, n times the same row um, values and of course then we would have perfectly linear correlation in say xi and therefore the matrix condition of uh, xi transpose times xi which we need here for that inverse uh, will be very bad uh, and possibly singular and therefore uh, we won't be uh, able to to solve that inverse here and we get very unfeasible values for w star or even no uh, values at all if uh, this is really completely linear correlated so we have to take care about that um, how is pi giving us that regressor inputs here for that matrix uh, and uh, one possible countermeasure is here to add in regularization which we also discussed in the last lecture rich regression was so was the uh, keyword here and basically what we do is for that um, inverse calculation of xi transpose times xi we just add a regularization term epsilon times the identity matrix uh, which is then equal to an um, yeah, l2 penalty on the parameter vectors on the parameter elements 
So this could be then a possible uh, countermeasure trying to get that inverse here numerically uh, feasible. Yeah, another point which has to be discussed, of course, is that uh, when we apply the ordinary least squares algorithm to a given data set, that the computational uh, complexity is with the uh, magnitude uh, of kappa 3, and kappa was the number of features inside our feature vector. So, of course, if you think of a uh, batch learning scenario where we may start with an initial batch of data where we um, calculate our TD fixed point and then maybe after that initial data set the uh, prediction algorithm or our policy in general gives us new data points which are added to the batch over time. Then if we apply OLS again so for every new data point we add to that uh, batch we would have to again uh, execute an algorithm with that computational complexity of the order uh, kappa 3, uh, which would be of course very computational costly. And the idea of recursively square is to uh, recursively add or incrementally add new data points to our least squares estimation. And the nice thing is if we do so, then each reinforce, uh, recursively square update is only uh, computational complex with the uh, order of kappa square and therefore we can save a lot of uh, computational demand if we add single data points to the batch after we already have um, derived an initial uh, fixed point uh, W star. And in the following we just represent you, let's say, the results uh, on how to apply the recursively uh, squares algorithm. However, you can also have a look at the detailed derivation of the formula, for example, in that lecture book here by Isaman, which is also available for you as an electronic copy on a Panda platform. So, how is the recursive uh, least squares temporal difference algorithm working? In every time step, what is happening, we get a new regressor vector, xi transpose, which is the feature vector again, transpose minus the discounted successor feature vector and we get a new update target which is basically as discussed the reward feedback from the environment. And then when we have received that new data point we can run an LLS update by three sub equations. First we have to calculate C which is basically an adaptive correction term in a vectorial fashion, so that's why it's a bold quantity here. And with that adaptive correction term, we can, in a least square sense, reduce over time this error between our linear estimation of a W times C transpose and our target Y. And then in the third step, we calculate an updated matrix P, capital P, which is in this case the so called covariance matrix. Uh, of the least squares estimator and this covariance matrix gives us insights into the quality and the characteristics of the linear estimator and for example can be also uh, monitored in terms of evaluating the uh, accuracy of the linear estimator. So basically if we have large values in P then the uncertainty regarding the linear estimation of the TD targets is relatively uh, uncertain relatively problematic. And with these yeah, three lines of uh, the RLS update we can then present the algorithmic implementation of RLS TD. So what do we need? Again we need of course a policy pi to be evaluated. We need a feature representation with in the linear case, so this is again a little bit more special compared to the regular TD algorithm. Uh, here we really have to ensure that already the feature representation at the terminal step, capital T is zero, because as we have a linear um, yeah, linear mapping between the feature vector and the state value uh, estimate, because only then we can really guarantee that uh, this mapping by v hat is also zero. So for the terminal step as discussed, so this is a really important requirement here, so that x till the at the terminal time step is zero. 
Well, we may also add a forgetting factor, so I didn't mention that here on the previous slide, oh my god. So uh, what we can also add is a so-called uh, forgetting factor lambda, which is optional. So if we uh, put lambda to 1, then basically what we get is a classical LSTD algorithm uh, where we don't forget anything from the past, so all data from the past is equally uh, weighted over time. However, if we introduce lambda smaller than 1, then basically what's happening, we scale up that uh, covariance matrix here and uh, scale also the correction factor here. And basically what is happening is that previous data points from the past are less weighted than more recent data points. And therefore the algorithm adapts itself to more recent data points. Um, the motivation for that, of course, could be if the environment is changing over time that we may want to forget data points from the real far past because they are not representative anymore. Or also, if you think of the control context, if the policy is changing, then we can use that recursive LSTD algorithm without um, without changing the algorithm in itself, but just by, uh, by tweaking, but just by tuning that uh, forgetting factor lambda here, such that data points from an old policy which is not the actual policy anymore uh, are also forgetting uh, are also forgotten over time so very nice feature here however it's only optional so if we put lambda to one then we don't forget anything and we get the let's say classic lstd algorithm without forgetting okay so we can work with that uh, forgetting factor it can be uh, one but should be greater than zero what do we have to initialize? Uh, two things. First, we have to again, of course, initialize the weighting uh, parameter W and the covariance matrix P is also something which we have to initialize and um, put into memory over time. And a classical initialization strategy would be to set a P equal to a scaled version of the identity matrix. Mm -hmm. And basically what we would do is we would put better to very large values if we don't have any clue how good this initialization here of the weighting parameters fits our state value prediction. Uh, and if we, for example, by um, expert knowledge, uh, know that our initial parameters W are already somehow well um, representing the state value estimate, then we can reduce better here to smaller values, so such as the, uh, that the elements of the core matrix get smaller. So with that, um, with that initialization, we can state how certain we are regarding the initial parameterization of W. However, if we don't have any clue regarding Ws, for example, we just take random values here for W or maybe zero also, then I would recommend to uh, put better to rather high values, maybe 100,000 or even 10,000 times that identity matrix. Yeah, then again, we run a couple of episodes and each episode we initialize x0. We get actions from our policy, which is being evaluated. We observe the new state, the reward feedback. Then here in these two lines, we just define our target of the uh, LSTD algorithm, our new regressor, regressor vector x transpose, and then uh, from the previous slide, uh, once after another, we calculate the corrective term C, uh, the new parameter W, and the new covariance matrix P, and do that until our successor state XK plus 1 is terminal. And with that um, algorithm, as we have discussed, we get in every time the TD fixed point of W and not only an incremental update, which is not squeezing out all possible informations from these data points. Yeah, yeah some more remarks on the usage of re uh, recursively squares in the L prediction scenario. So we already discussed that covariance matrix P can be inspected for the centenity analysis. Small values in P suggest that the uh, estimate by the linear estimator and W is rather accurate. High values in P, of course, indicate the opposite. Then lambda, the forgetting factor, is an optional uh, parameter. If we put lambda to zero, then the recursive least squares converges to the static solution of the OLS. And we don't forget something over time. 
So that would be of course problematic if we have a non-stationary problem. So either if our environment changes over time or if our policy is changing over time, putting lambda to zero wouldn't be the best idea. And therefore, in most of the cases when environment and or policy is changing over time, we want to forget something. We don't want to take into account the old, very old data from the data set. And therefore a classical tuning of lambda would be something between 0.95 and 0.99. However, we could also application dependent tune lambda k over time. So in every single time step. So it doesn't have to be a constant for the entire algorithm. We may also uh, add some heuristics in order to tune lambda on the way. So if we, for example, um, see that we have really um, a step-like change in the environment because something really significant changed in the environment um, way of behaving then we maybe shortly reduce lambda to smaller values in order to uh, quickly forget the old data and then when we have obtained enough new data from let's say this uh, updated environment then we can bring lambda again to higher values Yeah, also as seen in the previous slide with lambda smaller than one, uh, basically what's happening is we increase the covariance matrix elements and that could also lead to numerical instabilities uh, depending on the data set and on the uh, application. So you might uh, observe that the recursively squares algorithm with a forgetting factor smaller than one could get numerical instable. And in this case, uh, we would again, uh, as also for the ordinary least squares, have to add regularization um, and that can be done. Uh, we have uh, linked for you here, for example, in, uh, I believe also freely available on the internet if you just search for the title uh, paper, which is giving you detailed information about the combination of recursive least squares with forgetting factor and uh, regularization. We don't give the details here and just refer to the literature if you're interested. And of course, as mentioned also in the beginning of the uh, LSTD, that the general approach of recursive least squares could be also applicable to Monte Carlo or NSTEP-TD. However, we don't give the detailed algorithm here. You just can follow the same derivation as for the uh, TD0 step uh, approach and uh, evaluate on your own uh, formulations for Monte Carlo or NSTEP-TD. Yeah, and with that, we are through the batch learning approach where we really want to squeeze out as much as information as possible from a given data set. However, as we have discussed, we have the trade-off of the consistency of the data set if the environment is, is changing over time or the policy is changing over time. And therefore, this is more or less only a yeah, supplement to the gradient-based predictions. So, um, really depending on the application, what you should choose, either a classical gradient based or batch learning. Never mind, for the end of today's lecture, we want to have uh, a little discussion on possible extensions and modifications which are uh, beyond gradient based prediction. Because yeah, as we have discussed, gradient based um, prediction in the reinforcement learning uh, sense can have some possible issues. Uh, however, as I said, it's also a standard method, a standard approach to solve reinforcement learning prediction with gradient-based updates. However, what are the possible drawbacks? One drawback we already discussed, um, that uh, the SKD update, of course, if it converges, so if we have bad luck, it won't converge at all, it diverge. But if it converges, then it will only converge to a uh, local optimum uh, which is uh, close to the initial uh, parameter update w0. Uh, and therefore, depending on where we are in the um, parameter space here, uh, we may uh, don't get an, an local optimum, which is really, let's say, close in terms of the value to the global optimum, but really far away. And we don't know that. And of course, uh, a possible solution to that, which is also a very standard solution, is to reinitialize the learning all over again. So basically what we would use is we would use our reinforcement learning um, Zima gradient based temporal difference approach, for example, and just reinitialize W0 a couple of times, for example, by grid search or just by some random initialization and restart our learning 
all over again and then compare the learned uh, parameter vectors against each other and just maybe build an ensemble out of these different parameter vectors or just pick that parameter vector which seems to be most suitable to us in our given application. So we can try to uh, counteract this local uh, optima uh, problem with reinitialization of the entire learning. However, of course, this is also very computational demanding because we have to run the learning problem not only one time but 10 hundred times or how many times uh, depending on the application in order to uh, ensure or at least to be certain to find the uh, lo in local optimum which is close or as good as the global optimum second possible uh, problem with gradient based updates are that depending again on the application it's it's not a general statement it's it's clearly depending on the application that we are might be forced to use function approximators which partly consist of non-differential functions so par a couple of examples are shown here for example in figure 9.6 and due to that uh, singularities which are um, part of these functions uh, of course the calculations of the gradient become unfeasible and can cause heavy numerical problems in the overall gradient based update steps and uh, of course then uh, if we if we are stucking in our uh, parameter update process by such a singularity then of course uh, this would be very bad luck because we maybe calculated already a couple of minutes hours or whatsoever days in the um, in the past and then we suddenly reach such a uh, singularity here then the entire uh, optimization would uh, run nuts and uh, of course that would be uh, yeah really the worst case for us so in this case if we have um, non-differential function approximators then we really should take into account that maybe gradient free optimization could be an alternative to just say could be doesn't have to be of course we need also a consistent data set again to run gradient free optimization techniques on that basis of that um, consistent data set because gradient free optimization like meta heuristics such as evolutionary algorithms are of course also sampling uh, in the uh, state and parameter space and therefore the data set has to be consistent so same requirement as for batch learning here for gradient free optimization besides evolutionary algorithms we could also use uh, surrogate model based techniques such as bayesian optimization in order to find the next suitable parameter vector w and then at the end w star the best optimum like as illustrated here by this uh, evolutionary algorithm in a two-dimensional di uh, example uh, where the optimum would be around here but as you can see here from the ISO lines uh, at least this is a very convex problem so uh, here we really would not need it to apply uh, evolutionary algorithms here just using gradient descent would be really the way to go however in high dimensional uh, problem spaces uh, of course the picture may change completely so gradient free optimization could be an alternative to find uh, a suitable parameter vector w especially if we have um, function approximators with non-differential function parts but also in general even if the uh, function approximator is fully differentiable as i said if we have uh, non-linear optimization we have that uh, trade-off between local and global optima which we cannot really solve there is not this one optimization technique which will give us by guarantee the global optima optimum and in this case um, such gradient free optimization global optimization techniques like ea or bayesian optimization can really help to find us um, better uh, parameter vectors better, better function approximation um, parameters compared to plain stochastic gradient descent and if you're interested in let's say more 
details on uh, global optimization. I have linked here for you a very nice summary paper on the taxonomy of continuous global optimization, also freely available on archive.org. So you can just click on it and uh, get yourself a very nice overview about the potential uh, optimization tools which we can use for uh, function approximation tuning also in the reinforcement learning sense besides the standard gradient based descent and with that outlook on global optimization i also want like to summarize the today's lecture so basically we have started uh, with the statement that if the state space gets unfeasible large or even continuous that function approximation is really required we cannot use the table of methods anymore because we cannot cover uh, the entire state space with them in this case also feature engineering is of course of vital importance for the learning process especially if i'm able to uh, cover nonlinear effects within the feature engineering step then the nice thing is that we can use a linear function approximator which will uh, converge um, by guarantee because it's a quadratic optimization problem uh, and therefore yeah feature engineering is very important and uh, otherwise we have to use nonlinear or potentially nonlinear approximation tools like artificial neural networks or decision trees for example we have also discussed that the on policy prediction is rather straightforward we have to define an prediction objectives over the entire state space which uh, is very simple in the on-policy case or can be approximated in the on-policy case by the uh, sampled state trajectory and we took the mean squared error out of that so very nice and we skipped the off-policy case because here the transformation from behavior to, to target policy is uh, yeah, again somehow uh, yeah, complex, can add up uncertainty, can end up variance to the uh, prediction problem and uh, is a possible source of numerical instability. We have then also introduced the stochastic gradient descent to allow step-by-step -step based updates to prevent full gradient calculations over the entire problem space and we have found that uh, for the learning problem uh, if we apply bootstrapping then the update target of v pi gets also dependent on w and the true gradient becomes uh, computational complex however with semi-gradient methods we reduce the computational burden at accuracy costs because we just neglect the part of the true gradient which is bootstrapped Batch learning was then the yeah, last, or not last, but previous last point for today. Here we are trying to get all available information squeezed out of, uh, of a d given data set. If that function approximator, which should be learned here, is a linear, then we can get a closed form solution uh, by, um, for example, LSTD or also in a recursive fashion. However, of course, again, the batch learning data set which we are working with has to be representative and consistent and last but not least that uh, gradient based prediction we have discussed it at uh, different uh, yeah different occasions today uh, if in especially in the nonlinear or not especially more or less particular in the nonlinear case is risky we don't have any guarantee to converge we may diverge with our a prediction and also then later with our control algorithms and also we have a um, distinction to make between local and global optimum so we don't know if we really have the perfect fit of the state value functions here in the prediction case as discussed today which is of course a really big big difference compared to the table or methods because in the table or methods we really had the guarantees to find the true value functions in an MDP context and now with function approximation especially in the nonlinear case we completely lack these guarantees of perfect state value estimation slash prediction and with this summary I'm uh, done for today I thank you for your kind attention wish you a pleasant week and hope to see you soon bye bye